Hey, thank you for coming to listen. My name is Kathy, and this is our journal of learning about and living with lichen sclerosis. Each week, I either talk to someone or research an aspect of lichen sclerosis and bring you the information so you don't have to go searching. I bring you the real talk without the medical jargon. This week, I'm bringing you the second part of our two-part conversation with Dr. Jill Craft. She is a researcher, author, vulvar specialist, and educator who joined me in a conversation about steroids. In the first part, we discussed different steroids, myths, and concerns that people have around lichen sclerosis. For this conversation, she and I are going to go deep into the three questions that they were looking to answer in their research review, topical corticosteroids in the treatment of vulvar lichen sclerosis, a review of pharmacokinetics, and recommended dosing frequencies. So the first question that they asked was, do the steroids enter the blood screen? The second question was a compounded question, but the most important one was, do steroids thin the skin? And the third one was, are we dosing correctly? So if you have any of these questions and you want to know, what does the science say? You want to listen to this episode. Lichen Sclerosis Support Network's mission is to empower people with lichen sclerosis by providing them evidence-based information. We do that through this podcast, through our blog, videos, and our free events. If LSSN has touched your life and you would like to make a contribution so that we can continue our work, we would greatly appreciate it. Please make a donation at lssupportnetwork.org slash donate. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Kraft. This information is for educational purposes and does not constitute medical advice. Speak to your medical professional before making any changes to your care. First off, this is a review and not a clinical study. So tell us what the difference between those two kinds of researches is. Yes. So that's a really good place to start because when we are drawing conclusions from data, it's really important to know, number one, where the study came from, number two, how the study was done. And that helps us interpret the findings of the study as well as apply them to clinical situations as well as ourselves, right? And so when we're looking at different studies, there's different strengths of studies, if you will. The gold standard would be a randomized control trial. And that's where we basically take an intervention like a medication or something that we think makes a difference. um, And we compare it against a control situation. An example of that would be if I had 50 patients and 25 of them were taking a medication and the other 25 were given a sugar pill and we compare the effects that um, that we see in both groups to see if there's a difference between the treatment and the placebo or the control and so that would be the gold standard right and then within that study we would want to account for as many variables or other circumstances as possible and we would try to keep all of those circumstances as much the same as we possibly can. So we're just looking at the effect of that medication. So even within a gold standard study, like a randomized control trial, we can evaluate and criticize how well it was done by looking at the other variables involved, um, as well as bias, which is basically how the study might be changed by different factors. And it's good to criticize studies in this way, because we want to be as scientific as possible. We want to ensure that what we're looking at um, is real and Mm -hmm. it is reproducible and it's true. So we're really looking for the truth in, um, in these things. The next level is going to be a prospective study, which is basically where you take two groups of 
people or populations and one of them is is exposed to a certain condition and the other one's not and then you follow them forward and you see what the difference is between the two groups um, and then after that is retrospective which means we look back in the past so um, we can do what's called like a chart review where we look at a certain population um, or a certain population versus another population and see what has made a difference in the past or what has been different between two groups. And then we would look at systematic reviews, which are kind of like the gold standard of reviews. Basically, systematic reviews and meta-analysis is basically where we take a bunch of different studies and we put all of that patient data together and we analyze it with statistics. And we basically use a bunch of small studies to make almost like a big study. And that strengthens our findings. So it makes whatever we find a bit stronger. But as a criticism, we have to look at how those individual studies were done. And if there's a lot of differences between them, that we have to be cautious in how we interpret the results. The article that we're talking about is actually a narrative review, meaning we look at what is out there and we try to make sense of it, right? And so not every study can be done as a randomized control trial. There's reasons for that. Maybe logistically, it's it's just really difficult or impossible, or it's extraordinarily costly to be able to do it. Or maybe it's unethical. If we know that there's a treatment that works, then it would be wrong to have a control group where we don't offer that treatment, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's many limitations with the studies that we can do. That's why not every study can be a randomized control trial. The most important part about a study is what is the research question? What, it, what are we trying to get out of this, right? What are we trying to answer? And then you figure out, okay, what's the most trustworthy way to answer that question based on the conditions and logistics and funding that we have? And then you go from there. And just because a study or a review has criticisms, it doesn't make it not worth it or not valuable. I think we learn something from everything, but it is important to know what the downsides are when we're looking at this data. Just to clarify, this is a review. You you guys didn't take people and, you know, give them steroids and then test their skin and all of that good stuff. This is a review of past studies. And then you just made sense of what was already done. Why did you guys come together and feel like this is needed? And what exactly were you looking for? So we know that topical corticosteroids, and from here on out, I'll just call them topical steroids because it's just easier. Um, So we know that topical steroids are the gold standard of treatment for lichen sclerosis. And that's not just a statement that I'm just saying. It's actually Proven. So there's really high quality randomized control trials, um, really strong evidence that show that topical steroids work for lichen sclerosis. The question that we had is around the logistics of this, right? Because even though there's studies that show that they work, there's not a consensus on how to apply them, the best Mm -hmm. way to apply them, how long to apply them, um, just all of the nitty gritty of things. Like it's one, it's one thing to recommend a treatment and, or write a prescription for a treatment. It's another thing to know the best way to use it. And so in this review, we really wanted to explore what the science of the skin was when it comes to absorption of this medication, when it comes to the medication itself, when it comes to the delivery system, what are all the factors that are involved? And can that illuminate the path for us to figure out how to recommend using this medication? That is so, so true. Like we've had this discussion in the LS Warriors multiple times that You can go to two different doctors in the same city and you can get two different schedules. You can get two different application procedures. How do we know which one's right, right? It just depends on who you decide to listen to. It would be nice to have a more concise and clear, okay, these are the guidelines for 
everybody. And I think, like you said, the science is needed to back that up because everybody's going by what's worked for their patients, right? I always go back to breast cancer because until they were able to bring all the scientists, all the researchers, all the pharmaceutical companies and everybody together, a coalition of all of these different fields to compare data, to do the research together, they weren't able to get real answers to a lot of these questions on how to treat, how do we diagnose And so I think that's super important. So I love the fact that you guys did this work. Yes. And you you will see that different different specialists will have different approaches. Uh, Dermatologists may feel comfortable with a different approach than a gynecologist. I think that the important thing is there there often is not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And when we're making decisions, I think we need to base it on what is actually happening in the skin. Right. If we are basing our decisions on a rationale, I find that stronger than just saying, Oh, this is how we always did it. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And the, what's really interesting is, unfortunately, what we found when we did this review article is that there's not a lot of strong research guiding us here. Mm-hmm. And so what was very interesting, and I'm very interested in, in medical history and how things have evolved to current recommendations. And unfortunately, a lot of the current recommendations are based on very old, small studies that were most likely a bit of opinion. I'm not saying that that's good or bad. It's just where it evolved from. We have to understand where all of this came from. And then it just kind of repeated in studies, repeated in textbooks and so forth. And then we get these recommendations. But what we're looking at in this review article is where did these actually come from? And Mm. what are they based on? And does that make sense? And is there a way to make more sense of this uh, to support or refute what we're doing or to modify what we're doing? And that was what we were hoping to conclude out of, or at least start the discussion on out of this, out of this research study. In this review, you had three particular questions that you wanted to answer, and they're scientifically written. So I have dumbed them down to my grade level and let me know if I did not interpret them correct. The first question is how much of the topical steroid is absorbed into the skin and into the bloodstream on healthy skin and hardened skin? The second one is, what evidence is there that long-term use of topical steroids will thin the skin, suppress the adrenal glands, lower the body's immune system, and become less effective over time? And then the third thing you wanted to answer was, are current dosing guidelines in line with what we know about how vulvar skin absorbs topical steroids? Did I interpret those correctly? You did a phenomenal job with that. Yay! (laughs) Okay, awesome. Let's answer the first question. Okay. So how much of the topical steroids is absorbed into the skin and into the bloodstream on healthy and hardened skin? So the answer to this is a little bit scattered because it really depends on the strength of the steroid, how it's applied, the delivery van that it comes in, and so forth. And so there's not really good studies that compare all of these things. There's reason to believe that the thicker the skin, and this makes sense, the thicker the skin, the less medication is able to absorb or penetrate the skin, Mm. right? We do know that The rate limiting step of absorption is basically the top layer of the skin, which is called the stratum corneum. So this is- Wait, explain that again, because I didn't understand what you just said. Yes. So the, the rate limiting step, meaning the thing that determines the absorption level- Oh, okay. Is how thick the, the top layer of skin is. Okay. Right? Now I understand. And so- The other factors that are involved with absorption, it it goes from the beginning. It goes from how it's released from 
the bottle or tube that it's in. It's like, so even factors like that are a part of it. How much is used, the vehicle that it's in, and then how much it goes through the stratum corneum, which is the top layer of the skin. So just to give you an idea, in lichen sclerosis, the stratum corneum or the top layer of skin is really thick because it's keratotic. It has hyperkeratosis, like too many keratin cells, and like a corn or a callus would be. So the middle layer of the skin is hardened, and then the top layer of the skin is also hardened. Correct. But there's gradation Right. So it's not as hard. This brings another question then, because when we're looking at lichen sclerosis sometimes and you see that waxy, thin looking paper skin, is that hardened skin? I mean, because it looks thin. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, my my skin is so thin because it looks like it's so flat and shiny. Is it actually a hardened So here's the deal. When we look at it on histology, meaning when we take a biopsy of the skin and then they slice the biopsy um, and then they stain it and they look under the microscope, the top layer, the very, very, very top layer um, almost looks wispy. And so that very, 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 very top layer can actually be kind of thinned thinned out, if you will. Um, But the area below it is dense. Okay. And is that that because it's been so thick that it's been kind of stretched to its limit? Like the part that we can see has been stretched so thin. So that's why it it loses its um, like texture. You know, oftentimes we um, we describe it almost like wax paper. Mm -hmm. So it has almost like a crinkly waxy kind of appearance to it. Um, Kind of like if you were to stretch rubber band and then it comes back and it has almost like ridges in it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But all of these are when you look through a volvoscope. So all of this is through basically essentially a microscope. So it's not on a large scale. We're really looking with magnification when we're describing these changes on the skin. And that's why a volvoscope is often necessary, at least for initial diagnosis. And to determine the extent of the effects of the inflammation. Remember, all of this is a result of the inflammation going on under the skin. And that's not something that I can see with my eyes. That's Uh, something we can see on histology, meaning through a biopsy under the pathologist looks under the microscope, they can see all those little white blood cells, they appear purple. They're not they're not white under there, they're purple, because of the staining. But when I look at someone in exam, I can't see inflammation, but I can see the effects of the inflammation. inflammation. And for me, that interprets into the texture of the skin. That's what I'm looking for. Um, Of course, there's whiteness too. And whiteness is because of the inflammation attacking the pigment producing cells called melanocytes. So it basically attacks those pigment producing cells, making the skin look white. That doesn't always come back. And we can also see hyperpigmentation. We can actually see darkening of the skin as well. Usually it's a clue that there was inflammation once present um, that may no longer be there. It's usually no longer there. And I usually see that with areas that are resorbed or fused or sucked in like your labia minora. So I definitely have patients that have had lichen sclerosis active as a kid. um, And then they come to me because they have covering of the clitoris or whatever. They're not really symptomatic, but they're like, something's going on down here. Like my gynecologist Mm -hmm. said things look different. And so I look at it and I say, oh, were you an itchy kid? Um, And so they usually say, oh, yeah, like my mom took me to like doctor's visits because they thought I had urinary tract infections or they thought I had yeast infections or whatever. They thought it was so weird. Um, And so you'll often kind of get this history. And so there may not be any active lichen sclerosis going on at that point, but there's subtle signs that I can see that would show me that it was once present. And the darkening is one of those signs for me. We call it, this is a kind of not a great term, but we call it like burnt out lichen sclerosis, like where it's, it was once present, but it's no longer active. The other thing with the darkening, you want to get any, you know, darkened 
lesions or um, moles or areas really checked out because melanoma can happen on the vulva. Um, but oftentimes people will be really worried because they're like, oh, why is it so dark? And I can reassure them, no, this is nothing to worry about. This isn't skin cancer. This is an effect of the inflammation from the lichen sclerosis, but the skin looks looks uh, normal texture now. There's no activity or you're in yeah. remission. We had a couple ladies in the group who had a, a brown spot appear around the clitoris or on the labia minora. And um, after some research, I did find out about the hyperpigmentation. And then she went to her doctor and that's what she basically, the doctor exactly. told them that it, that's what it was. So It's always best to get things checked out if you're not mm -hmm. sure, though, um, because, you know, there can be conditions that we want to rule out. You know, they, they may be uncommon, but if they're present, it's something you definitely want to take care of. So getting back to the question that you guys were answering, did you find that the topical steroid did get into the bloodstream? Or does it stay localized? So the answer is that there is a small amount that does enter the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. That is based on very limited data. We don't have a ton of evidence on how this all works, but we do know that there is a little bit that gets into the bloodstream. The best study that we have on this shows that that little amount stays below threshold levels, meaning it's not to any level that usually causes symptoms or effects or anything like that. You know, same with any medication, right? Like even local estrogen, there's a small amount that gets that goes into the bloodstream. But then if that amount is below threshold levels, then we're not concerned about increased risk of things like breast cancer, right? So same with steroids, there is a very, very, very small amount. Now where this becomes an issue is two things. There's definitely people out there that are extraordinarily sensitive, right? Mm -hmm. I have to say, though, out of all of my patients, I can count on less than one, like on one hand, those patients. I, def I can think of three people out of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients that I have that are truly too sensitive for topical steroids. The other real consideration, and we don't have good evidence to guide us on this, is people with glaucoma, it could be an issue. I do have an older patient with glaucoma, and we talked about risk and benefit. In the end, she decided that the itching was too too much. She needed to treat her lichen sclerosis. And what we did was I'm working with her ophthalmologist, her eye doctor, so she can get more frequent glaucoma checks. So she's been doing it every three months. So far, there's been no worsening in her eye condition. How long has she been on the steroids? For, for a long time. For, for a long time. Okay. Yeah. And so that's just one patient. So we have to be careful interpreting right. from there. But it's something, right? If right. we have no evidence to guide us, then this is something. And so I think steroids are like any medication. Every medication has right. risks associated and has benefits. You have to determine if the benefits outweigh the risk and if any additional monitoring needs done based on the potential risks. Yeah, That small amount, that was in hardened skin or was that in healthy skin? So at least one of the studies was in lichen sclerosis. These are that, small numbers, like two studies only, um, um, very small. And so I wouldn't go as far as to say that this is dangerous or detrimental in any way, right? What we do know is that almost all women who use topical steroids do not have systemic effects from it. We, right. we know that. Um, and so, you know, when we're looking at some of the other conditions, like Cushing syndrome and adrenal effects and things like that, you know, the, there, first of all, there were very few studies that actually reported anything like that. And those studies were usually case reports. So it was like an out of the ordinary, let me tell you about this patient that had this effect. And I don't believe any of those were in lichen sclerosis. It's mostly with people with uh, psoriasis or eczema who have it like all over their body. So they're basically mm -hmm. applying a topical steroid on a, on a very large surface area. Right. And so, you know, some of the absorption into the bloodstream is really going to depend on how large of a surface area you're applying the medication and how much of the medication you're applying. How often, um, remember, right? in lichen sclerosis, you're using a pea-sized amount, 
pea sized. I mean, that's 0.5 grams. That's so tiny. And more is not better. You do not need to use more than that. Like this is an ultra potent topical steroid. Um, So you only need a pea sized amount distributed around the area. I may sometimes recommend using a a smidge more for the perianal area, depending of of a topical steroid, not always an ultra potent. It really depends on the clinical picture and how the skin looks and how thick the skin is. But we have to remember that the vulva is really small area compared to like someone's entire back or someone's entire legs or abdomen. And then the amount that we're using is very, very, very small. And so, you know, the only things that have been reported have really been these out of the ordinary, long term, a lot of dosage, extensive skin condition diseases, and it really hasn't been in lichen sclerosis. That leads to the next question you guys were trying to answer, which is what evidence is there that long term use of topical steroids will thin the skin? suppress the adrenal glands, lower the body's immune system, and become less effective over time. So what did you guys find out? Yeah, so let's start with thinning the skin. So atrophy That's a popular is one. all worried about, right? <laughs> it's what everybody hears about. Um, and it's the most common side effect of topical steroids, to be fair. It happens, right? There's like a pharmacokinetic reason for it that I'm not going to go into, but it it is real. It can it can definitely thin the skin. However, when we're talking about thinning of the skin, we're not necessarily talking about lichen sclerosis skin, right? Mm-hmm. And the issue is that this side effect is basically applied for everything or warned for everything and it's on the package insert and everything like that, but we're not always considering how it's being used and why it's being used. Just to give you an example of how lichen sclerosis skin is is not like normal skin, when we look at the stratum corneum, so the top middle layer um, that's thickened, so they've actually measured it. So in lichen sclerosis, it measures 1200 micrometers, okay? okay? Remember that number. So what do you think it is in normal vulvar skin? Mm. So it's a, so it's so much thicker. I'm going to say 200. Close. That was really good. It's 170 micrometers. Oh. You, that's impressive. So lichen sclerosis skin has a seven times thicker layer than normal skin. That's so nice. when we're talking about thinning that skin... You want to thin, thin that skin, right? You need to thin that skin. If it's done in a very controlled way, right? Right. We have to keep that in mind. There's not literature on thinning of the skin specifically for lichen sclerosis. So first we have to say that. So any thinning of the skin is either in normal skin, in animal models, in bench research situations, or in other conditions. So that's the first step of, that's the first thing to realize. The other thing is that there's been multiple studies that have looked at Um, like long-term maintenance steroid regimens. So getting Mm -hmm. someone in remission by applying it more often and then tapering down and then doing a maintenance dose and following people out. Um, And those studies were not tailored to look at atrophy, right? But it was one of the endpoints that they did look at in addition to many other things. And so in all of the studies that that was mentioned, we actually included that in a table in the study. Um, And there were a number of those studies. And the largest one was 80 people, um, which is pretty good. That's a good size for lichen sclerosis. And Mm -hmm. they were specifically using clobetazole um, in an ointment form. And they regimen, which is a little more aggressive than what I do, was a application of daily clobetazole ointment for three months, okay, mm-hmm. which I don't usually use it that long, but that's fine. And then going down to three times a week until the patient was in remission, okay? okay. They followed these women out for a median of 4.7 years. So median means the middle point. So some of these women were longer followed. Some of these women were shorter followed. But we're talking about almost five years, which actually is really, really good for a study because the longer the study, the more money it requires to actually do. And they found that there was no systemic or local 
effects. So, so no systemic effects and no local atrophic effects. So no yeah. skin thinning and no um, systemic um, issues from the steroid. And that's the best study that we have. Again, it's just one study, um, but there's also a number of other ones that have less people in them or were followed for less time that also there was no atrophy. The only way that we can absolutely with very high certainty show that this isn't an issue is to really take people that were diagnosed with lichen sclerosis and do a biopsy on them and then have them use a long-term steroid regimen for like 10, 20 years, however long, and then repeat biopsies on them when they're in remission um, and to show that there's absolutely no atrophy. Um, that's something that we've toyed around with, Dr. Goldstein and myself. We've, we've talked about doing a study like that. The problem is that in order to have a person as their own control, you'd have to follow them for 10 to 20 years. So mm -hmm. that means that this data would not come out for, you know, a generation or two. Right. Um, the other problem is then you'd be doing biopsies on people that are asymptomatic, right? Um, so which you have to have people volunteer for. So there's a lot of issue with doing a study like that just to sh show something that we have a feeling is already right. true. But, you know, that being said, um, you know, we'll keep thinking about how we could possibly do this. The thing that's going against us is that in the past, historically, lichen sclerosis, as you know, was called lichen sclerosis et atrophicus, which means thickening scarring of atrophy. Okay. Mm. So, Initially, because of the outward appearance of the skin, we thought that it was a condition of the skin being too thin. It's, that's not true. We know that's not true because we have the histology to show that, um, which has evolved since the time that this was originally discovered, um, you know, hundreds of years ago. And There's so a lot of catching up to do on a lot, a lot of, of the medical sites. <laughs> and then the, other, the other part of this is that steroids have gotten a bad rap. Um, yes. And I think it's because people are reacting to them because they're not being used in the correct Properly. way. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's my general suspicion um, for a majority of people. And then there's a mini minority of people, a small amount of people that really it's just not the best option for them. Yeah. Right. And they're being used the wrong way because we we're not getting the correct guidance. We're correct. not getting the correct guidance because there is it the science. But you're working on that. So I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you got it. And how would, you know, if doctors aren't telling you how to use them because they don't know and the science really isn't there and this is all, you know, based on trial and error. And so what we're trying to do here is really try to figure out, okay, what is going on from a science standpoint? What is going on in the skin? Until we have quality studies to show it, we need to basically base it on how the body works, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that the bottom line is that our experience, okay, which is a lower level than any studies, right? But my experience is worth something. My experience is that I don't have patients that have atrophy who apply topical steroids in the correct way at a maintenance dose for long term. I just, they don't develop atrophy. Now, people can develop atrophy if they are applying it on normal skin that doesn't have lichen sclerosis, which I've okay. seen, okay? So misdiagnosed. Um, I've seen it when they're applying it on skin outside the border of where their active lichen sclerosis is or has been. Like, um, for example, the groin creases, mm. that issue is very thin. If you apply a steroid there, you're going to get side effects from that. It's going to thin right. the skin. You're going to develop abnormal blood vessels. You're going to develop redness, and you're probably going to develop a fungal infection in that area. Lichen sclerosis doesn't go into the skin creases. So if you have symptoms out there like itching, it's usually redness, and it's usually yeast. The other three conditions suppress the adrenal glands, lower the body's immune system, and uh, become less effective over time. I don't hear those as often, but did you find any evidence that those are the case? Really with the adrenal glands, like I said, it's super, super, super rare. None of the, none of the studies were in lichen sclerosis. We're really talking about the case studies that looked at like really large areas of the body and really high doses. Um, and these are case studies. So, you know, just people reporting what they 
you know, one person. Um, as far as the, um, as far as the cis, uh, whole body absorption, we, we covered that mainly, but that's really, really, it's not to the level where we would be concerned about anything. It's really negligible, if any at all. There weren't many studies on this and the studies that were done were not really looking at um, like in sclerosis, except for one, which showed that it was so low that it was barely detectable. And so these aren't really, you know, big concerns. And, and again, we don't in the support groups, we really don't hear these things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, you know, out of the hundreds of patients I've treated, I've had, you know, maybe, you know, two or three that felt like they got jittery or they got, you know, they had headaches. I've heard, I've headaches heard headaches. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I take that seriously and, and we'll consider other treatment options for those patients. Um, but again, this is extraordinarily, extraordinarily uncommon. And then as far as becoming less effective over time, we don't have good evidence for that as well. The problem is with a lot of the long-term regimens, the biggest thing that happens is people fall off the wagon. Yeah. So they have, Stop you using know, it. Exactly. So we think that, you know, the less effective over time might just be because people aren't using it. Um, they're not soaking prior or they're not um, applying it as often or they're not applying it at all. And so that's more likely the cause of some of these. So this theoretical concern is the reason why we do taper the medication. Mm -hmm. At least that's what it's often cited in the guidelines and in chapters and things like that. I would argue that, you know, the reason that I taper the medication is not because I'm worried that it's going to be less effective. The reason that I taper the medication is because the steroid works to decrease inflammation, the skin is regenerating and becoming more normal. And because it's less dense and less thick and less keratinized, the steroids are able to penetrate better. And so you need to use it less frequently because more of the medication is getting down to the layer that it needs to get to. So mm -hmm. when you have that really thick skin, you may have to put it on once a day because only a, a percentage is getting down to that bottom layer. Whereas as the skin becomes healthier and healthier, more is effectively getting down to the bottom layer. And the reason that we do maintenance dosing at two times a week is because a steroid ointment stays in the skin for three to four days. And so you can do the math, three to four days, three to four days. What is that? That's twice a week. So you're getting the medication where it needs to go. The skin above it has is in remission. So all of that medication is going where it needs to. It's the perfect dose for it. And it's staying in there continuously because of the way that the medication is working and how long it works. So all of this is science-based. So the last question, and this is probably the most interesting one, <laughs> is our current dosing guidelines in line with what we know about how vulva skin absorbs topical steroids? Were you guys able to get any kind of clarity on that? <laughs> So it sounds like a really interesting question, and I really want to have a definitive answer. But unfortunately, what we found is that there's not a definitive answer on this. There are two main guidelines that exist, the European guidelines and the British Association of Dermatology guidelines or the BAD guidelines. They're similar. They're very similar. There's, there's differences in them. Basically, what we found, and I, you know, some of this may be biased, but what we found is the literature and the available research and what we know about the body and how this condition works supports how we how we recommend you use the steroids, meaning the soaking prior, the rubbing in for an extended period of time and the dosing regimens, which are in line with the guidelines. They're just a bit more specific. There's an idea, and I know that we don't have a ton of time to go into all of this, but there's you know the question of CO2 laser. We do know based on the recent randomized control trials that it makes skin look better. It, it, it helps skin look better. But from a biopsy standpoint on the histology, it does not decrease inflammation, at least based on the studies that we have currently. But there is a discussion, and I have no evidence to back this up. This is just discussion amongst uh, actually a group of experts that was on a webinar. And this is my theory. The CO2 laser basically pokes little holes in the tissue. I think it increases permeability. And so it, there might be a role for steroid pretreatment or a use during with application of the of the steroid. 
Hmm. Meaning like you could use the laser to increase the effectiveness potentially of the steroid because it would allow the steroid to penetrate better because it's putting basically little holes and helping regenerate the tissue a little bit. But then my argument to that group was, well, why would you spend thousands of dollars on a CO2 laser when you could just soak in a sitz bath? Exactly. But I do think if there's people that do not respond to initial treatment, like they're really tough to treat, that may be an option for them, right? Like if everything's not working, then they may want to consider that. But I would say that it probably, and we have no literature, that's a caveat here, and no literature on CO, like CO2 laser, we have very limited studies on this as well. We have a few, but very limited. But I would say in those really tough cases, maybe there is utility for using the laser as an adjunct for uh, topical steroid treatment. So then as a researcher, let me ask you this. If that's the case, then why not steroid injections? We do do those sometimes. So, and there's no literature on that. But I, if I have patients that have a lot of thickening of the skin, like really, really strong, and I've done a biopsy and it's not precancer or cancer, I will actually inject steroid into that tissue and it works well. I do this very uncommonly because it's very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I will, I will do that. I think there's multiple ways to do this. And I think that the most important thing is when you know what's happening in the skin, when you know the why behind it, then you can develop these research questions. And then you can say, okay, well, how do we actually target what's happening? And there's multiple ways to potentially do that. And we can develop studies that look at that. Perhaps we need to look at laser and and topical steroids together. And we need to compare one versus the other versus them together versus nothing. You know, that would be the ultimate study. The issue is that all of that requires a lot of funding. And it's, it's hard to do. It also requires a lot of people to volunteer. Yeah. Yes, um, and people to get biopsies, which yeah. is invasive. And so, you know, it's easy to say, oh, there's not research, or there's not good research, you know, why isn't there more quality research? It's not for lack of trying. All of this has a lot of a lot of challenges. And if people are passionate about this, help us volunteer for clinical studies, become a research assistant, right? You know, donate to research uh in this area. That's how we're going to get the answers that we need to figure all of this out. It sounds like we are good for right now with the guidelines that we have. And I'm so, so happy you've tackled this question of steroids thin the skin, because that has been like the number one objection to, I don't want to use steroids, which I totally respect everybody's decision on how you want to treat your body. I just want people to be fully educated and base that decision on evidence-based information. It's super important. And that's why I appreciate the work that you and Dr. Goldstein do to tackle these questions. Because like you said, it is hard and it's expensive and it's hard to find people that are willing to go through I talked to Leah Mitchell about the process of holding a clinical trial from from the patient's side. And it's a lot. It's a commitment that you really have to think about and decide, was it worth it? So I appreciate your time. I, I always love talking to you. I learned so much. I hope this is not the last time we do this. <laughs> of course not. I always enjoy hearing patient perspective. And I always... I always like breaking things down in this way because it's absolutely necessary and knowledge is power. And I applaud what you are doing with the Lichen Sclerosis Support Network. I think it's wonderful that we have a directory of providers now and I just see things growing in the future. So I'm excited. Thank you so much. And if anybody wants to follow Dr. Kraft on Instagram or Facebook, her Handle is at JillCraftMD. And if you want to schedule an appointment with her, you go to the CVVD.org and fill out their uh, email questionnaire thing there and they will get in touch with you. So there you have it. Unfortunately, we still don't have 100% straight answers 
to some of these questions, but I do hope that you now have a better understanding of why we do the things that we do when we're talking about steroid treatment. It's important that you know what lichen sclerosis does to the skin so that you can then understand why we use the steroids and why it's important we use the steroids in a certain way. I hope you found this information helpful. I I hope that it cleared up some things for you. And I hope that you have an amazing week. And I will talk to you next time. Bye.